the most successful theory in physics combines the weirdness of quantum mechanics with, well, the weirdness of special relativity to give quantum field theory. This theory tells us that particles can be created and destroyed during interactions. Even so, every observer agrees on whether a particle exists or not, right? Yeah, about that. Both theories of relativity, special and general, tell us that many things are observer dependent. Different observers might disagree about speeds, lengths or times, but the laws of physics should be the same for everyone. And for two observers with very different but constant speeds, inertial observers, the vacuum itself should appear the same. But relativity can throw some weirder things into the mix, specifically the idea of a horizon. For example, the event horizon of a black hole, out of which no information can travel, or the cosmological horizon that limits the observable universe. And a strange type of apparent event horizon even appears when we accelerate. Generally speaking, a horizon is a boundary in space-time from beyond which no influence can pass. It limits an observer's causal connection to part of the universe. As weird as these space-times with horizons may be, the statement from before holds. The fundamental laws of physics shouldn't change if we go near a black hole or if we start accelerating. But enforcing this isn't automatic, and something has to give. As it turns out, what gives is the nature of the vacuum. And in fact, the notion of what a particle is becomes observer-dependent. In coming episodes, we'll be delving into Hawking radiation and the Unruh effect, both of which are very similar and are results of this observer-dependent vacuum. There are a couple of compelling but inaccurate explanations of Hawking radiation around, and here at Spacetime, we want to be as simple as we can, but no simpler. So we're going to take this episode to lay the final stepping stone we need to examine these effects in detail and accurately. To get at this idea of observer-dependent particles and vacua, we're going to need some quantum field theory, and we're going to need to draw heavily on this recent episode. In QFT, we think about each particle type as having its own quantum field that exists at all locations in space. If the field vibrates with a single quantum of energy, we see a particle. That oscillation can be distributed over some region of space, representing the possible positions of the particle. The properties of the particles are encoded in the properties of the fields. The laws of physics as we know them are the rules defining how particles interact. For the laws of physics to be consistent, the fundamental properties of these fields must be the same for all observers. Imagine, I fire a pair of photons which annihilate to produce an electron-positron pair. All observers, be they floating in empty space or accelerating or orbiting a black hole, should agree on the basic result of that interaction. Two photons in, one electron, one positron, out. That means everyone has to agree on the fundamental nature of the quantum fields that describe these particles and the way they interact. There's no conflict for constant speed inertial observers. In fact, quantum field theory is what we call Lorentz invariant. Special relativity is built in, so the equations describing the interaction transform cleanly between inertial reference frames in a way that leaves the laws of physics and the nature of the vacuum intact. But when an observer who sees a horizon tries to write down these equations, in order to preserve the laws of physics, they find they have to redefine the nature of the vacuum itself. To see how this happens, we need to think about how particles, interactions, and vacuums are described in quantum field theory. Imagine the simplest type of quantum field. It's comprised of oscillators at all locations, a bit like a bed of springs that are all attached to each other, or even better, an infinite, extremely flexible drum skin. Now, imagine an oscillation in any one of these locations, a particle perfectly localized in space, a single spring or a single point on the drum skin. That oscillator can increase in energy in discrete chunks, in quanta. And we interpret each quantum of energy as representing a single particle. Now, every point in this field, this drum skin, is connected to neighboring points. The equations we write to describe the oscillations are coupled to each other. 
This coupling allows the oscillation, the particle, to evolve through space, but it also makes it devilishly difficult to solve those equations because the individual oscillations in space can't be solved independently. But there's a neat trick to get around this. As we saw in our recent episode on Fourier transforms, it's possible to describe any vibration or wave in two ways. Sound waves can be described in terms of variation over time or variation over frequency. Quantum wave functions and quantum fields can be described in terms of variation with position or variations with momentum. So instead of writing the field as having a value at every possible position in space, we can write it as having a value for every possible momentum. We switch between them with a Fourier transform. So let's take our spatial quantum field, our drum skin, with its single localized particle and transform to momentum space. That momentum field also has infinite oscillators, but now each one represents a different possible momentum for the particle. Bizarrely, in momentum space, that single perfectly localized position oscillation can also be described as an infinite number of unlocalized momentum oscillations. Now, each one of these momentum modes exists at all spatial points in the universe. If we add these momentum oscillations together with the right weightings, they cancel out everywhere except at the spatial location of the original particle. The superposition of infinite universe-sized momentum oscillators, momentum particles, can represent a single spatial oscillator, one particle at one point in the universe. Let's go back to the slightly less abstract infinite drum skin. Now, it starts out with no oscillations, analogous to the vacuum state in quantum field theory. If we were to make an excitation at a particular spot, make a particle, we hit that spot with a drumstick and set the oscillation going. Most of the amplitude will be where we hit it, but really the vibration will extend everywhere on the drum. We could, in principle, make the same oscillation by simultaneously hitting the drum everywhere with an infinite drumstick, adding global vibrations with different frequencies that cancel out everywhere except that one spot. But why exchange a single spatial equation for infinite equations in momentum space? Well, because they actually make the mathematics much easier. Those momentum oscillations have two important qualities. They behave like simple harmonic oscillators, so their value over time is like a simple sine wave. But even more importantly, they are uncoupled. The field at each momentum spot oscillates independently from its neighboring momenta. Dealing with uncoupled equations allows you to add and subtract oscillations without affecting the neighboring momenta. However, changing the momentum modes does affect the superposition, the sum of all oscillations. For example, by creating or destroying particles. Okay, so a single particle can be described as many oscillations in momentum space. Those oscillations can be reconfigured with our infinite drumstick to add new particles or remove old ones. For example, to describe a particle interaction, like those two photons annihilating into an electron-positron pair. There's a nice mechanism in quantum field theory for doing this. It's called the field operator, and it is our infinite drumstick. It's comprised of a creation and an annihilation operator that can raise or lower the number of particles one at a time by changing the number of particles or oscillations in each momentum mode. Here, the field operator represents the field properties or the laws of physics. This is the thing that needs to be the same for everyone. But there's no such restriction for the creation and annihilation operators it's made of, and it's these operators that define the vacuum. As discussed in a previous episode, we can think of the vacuum as a sea of virtual particles. In momentum space, we can think of it as a superposition of infinitely many momentum modes. Infinite, spatially undefined particles with defined momenta. And these just happen to cancel each other out, leaving zero particles, or a vacuum. Okay, so what happens when we add a horizon to our infinite quantum field? What if, say, there's an edge to the drum skin, or we cut a hole in the middle? Now our skin responds very differently to the drumstick. 
For example, we no longer have access to part of the skin and oscillations can reflect from the boundary. If we want to make the same particle as before, we need to strike the remaining part of the skin in a very different way, with different forces at each point. Well, the same is true of the universe. If we introduce an event horizon, then we lose access to some momentum modes, while other modes behave very differently. That means we have to reconfigure our old field operator, our infinite drumstick, in order to create and annihilate the same particles as we had in an infinite horizonless universe. We need to rejig the field operator for the laws of physics to be consistent. Now, if you'll forgive a little QFT jargon, the new annihilation operator needs to be a mix of the old annihilation operator and the old creation operator. Well, now, when you use the new rejigged field operator to describe the vacuum, some momentum modes that once cancelled out no longer cancel out. What was once a vacuum now has particles. So you can beat that horizoned drum skin to produce oscillations that are consistent with the infinite unhorizoned skin. But doing so leaves additional oscillations. What does that look like? It looks like heat. The vacuum acquires a non-zero temperature. It appears to be bathed in thermal particles, particles that don't exist for an observer who doesn't see that horizon. In some cases, changing the boundaries of space-time actually reduces the number of particles, for example in the Casimir effect. Now we've already seen how this effect reduces the energy of the vacuum between conducting plates. In upcoming episodes, we'll apply these ideas to finally understand Unruh and Hawking radiation. So this year, keep your eye on the horizon, the event horizon, and the strange things it does to the quantum contents of space-time. As always, thanks a million to all of our Patreon supporters. It's hard to be sure of anything in this relative universe, whether it's the existence of a particle or funds for a YouTube show. But your regular support gives us some wonderful surety. And an extra huge thank you to Anton Lifshitz, whose support at the Big Bang level is really helping to keep the annihilation operators at bay. Last week, we talked about the sounds that stars make, the wonderful worlds of helio and astro seismology. You guys had some really good questions. Loki and Alex asked whether seismic activity in neutron stars can be used to probe their interior properties. Well, actually, yes. Neutron stars certainly seem to experience star quakes, massive releases of energy as the star's iron crust cracks. These are observed as X-ray flares. Extremely large quakes can set the entire star ringing, which is observable in its effect on the extremely regular flashes of its pulsar jet. Actually, this is really a whole episode worth of awesome, so I won't go on right now. Several of you asked where the sounds of stars we played at the end of the last episode came from. Well, first I want to apologize for not linking these immediately. They were a last minute happy discovery the day before release, and we dropped the ball in our rush. Now these are from Asteroseismology Simulations, made by Manuel Perez de Lema Lopez. The frequency spectra for resonant oscillations of several stars were shifted to a range audible to human hearing. The results are eerie and amazing. Link in the description. No justice, no peace wonders whether stars may actually be speaking, considering Penrose's quantum brain hypothesis, which states that any sufficiently complex system creates consciousness. Well, let me first say that I really like this idea for a sci-fi book, but my first objection would be regarding Penrose's idea that neurons perform a sort of quantum computation and that this is the source of consciousness. There's so little evidence that this either happens or is even needed to explain consciousness that it's hard to take it seriously. It feels like it's in the family of, we don't understand it, so it must be quantum mechanics. Obviously, Roger Penrose is a genius, so there's more to it than that, but geniuses say a lot of stuff, and not all of it's right. Second, stars aren't complex in the sense that Penrose means. Complexity implies intricate structure like a neural network, things that are capable of organizing information. Stellar interiors are more simple and chaotic than they are complex and structured. All that said, I love the idea of stars twinkling meaningfully at each other from across the galaxy. 